You have your Hollywood face on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I threw that on. <laughs> I'm so glad we could connect. I mean, I know you had to shoot a commercial yesterday and everything. I did. I did. And my business partner is still shooting um, today. It's for Kerrygold Butter. Do you know Kerrygold? Yes. <laughs> very yeah. Irish. Very Irish. Very delicious butter, grass-fed butter. So it's bright yellow because of what the cows eat. And um, and so we yesterday we shot all of the intros and outros for the commercials. And today my partner has the job of making all of the food. And wow. yeah, yeah. Tell me about tell me about how that happens. When does it become? I mean, you were started off as a writer or started off as a foodie? Well, I started out as a foodie who wanted to write. So I started working in restaurants when I was in high school and I just loved food and how food brought people together. I felt always felt really comfortable in, a, in my big family, you know, in the kitchen. But then when I started working in restaurants, I was like, wow, there's a whole community around people who work in food. But I wasn't sure that I wanted to um, work in restaurants always. I was really interested in writing. And so I thought, I wonder if people have jobs as food writers. And back <laughs> then, that was a very long time ago. You know, back then it wasn't really the culture of like celebrity chefs and food magazines as much. Right. So, so the path to doing it wasn't it wasn't very easy, but oftentimes, you know, the path to doing what's really the right thing for you. Um, takes a lot of figuring out. It's so, yeah, it's nonlinear. It's not linear. It's definitely circuitous. But <laughs> I, but I started writing freelance about food, and one thing led to another. So I started writing for small, tiny magazines and tiny newspapers, and then websites. And the great thing about nowadays is, you know, there's so many websites and blogs, um, and social feeds that kids can um, contribute to. So there's so many more points of entry for people who want to write about food. That's true. Although the, the, the print medium, you know, if you, you started in print, which was more of a niche market, I guess, initially. And right. then, and, and I guess the internet, internet makes it more egalitarian in that way. Totally. But also, I guess the, for like someone coming up now, they can publish themselves, but yet they don't necessarily have the access to get attention, right? The because platform, there's so sure. much content. The platform, exactly, exactly. It helps to to partner with a um, brand like Kerry Gold, right? They that we're doing these commercials for. They then publicize us, or to partner with you know other other people on on Instagram who then promote you. So yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah. So you, um, well, first of all, I have to, I have to begin with a major life question. What's that? Is it too early for a glass of champagne? <laughs> it is for me, but it's not for you. <laughs> only all because right, that's a good answer. Well, because... I'm on the north end of town, or the, I guess the west end of town. So you know, it's a time difference. Um, I have work to do. I haven't even had lunch yet. <laughs> 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 I've been up since like I don't know. We list our house became uh, our our listing became live today. So oh, thank you, thanks. That, that's why I was already thinking of celebrating my yes. <laughs> yeah, um, I raise a question for that. So you shifted from food writing to food education. I did. So I wrote about food for let's see. 20 some odd years. I, um, I, I wrote for the New York Times dining section. And then I was a reporter for the time, Times dining section. And I also did restaurant reviews. Um, I did a column called 25 and under. And then I started working at food magazines. And I, um, I instead of writing, I was, I was editing. And that's something that I think a lot of young people don't know the career path for editing is a whole other thing. It's um, a, there's, you know, every writer needs an editor. And right. so 
there are so many um, opportunities um, in uh, as an editor. And so I worked at magazines for years and, and digital magazines. Um, I worked at Martha Stewart Living. I worked at Rachel Ray, um, Every Day with Rachel Ray. And she's really great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I worked um, at Food and Wine. Um, and then, you know, I have a son who is almost 16. And, um, I, you know, I didn't have a lot of time when I was working at, in these um, companies to to be home with him and to actually make the dinners that I was often writing about. Um, so I had a sort of change of heart mm -hmm. and I decided to open a cooking school for youth to um, to empower them in the kitchen and to find their niche in food. And um, and we started an after school program where we teach kids how to cook dinner. And that's what I do now. Wow. Wow. And you also have a very uh, active Instagram, right? I mean, do a lot, you have a lot of people following you on Instagram. Uh, I mean, I don't have as many as lots of people, but I, you know, I, um, I have a healthy following, I'd say, you know, it's over, over the years, it's kind of, it's crept up. So I love this. Oh my goodness. This was. That's, that's my garden in Athens. Yep. I think you have the best barn in town. It, it's pretty cute. I like it too. Yeah. It needs, it needs a repair, but. Um, wow. Don't we all. So, so that, yeah, that's my Instagram. And um, now talk right. to me about the visual relationship people have with food in your opinion. Well, that's a really good question. Um, so, f I mean, food is, f I often say that food is a very um, sensual um, medium, right? We, we, we smell it, we touch it, we eat it, we, you know. And so it's very important that, that the food um, looks delicious, that it looks like something you want to just take a bite out of, um, that you can see see the beauty of, of the food. And so when I photograph food, I try to capture, um, you know, I try to capture the light that makes it gorgeous, the textures. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, um, I try to make it look real, you know, um, not very, yeah, look at those pancakes. Those were delicious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then, and it doesn't and that's my son um over to the right who he was taking one of our classes nice. um, our classes are, so my my cooking school is called the dynamite shop and we um we do classes twice a day um at four o'clock and six o'clock and we make a different dinner every week so you you should join us and and check it out it's really it's really great what's nice too during quarantine is that um you know, it's a great way to see people and connect in the kitchen. Yeah. Even though we're not in our own, we're, we're in our own kitchens and not all together. So that must be this, this photo. Um, this is Zoom. That's yeah, our, yeah, yeah. Is your, is your crew. That's it. And your son takes part in a lot of this uh, in, in your lessons or does he see that as your world or is it more integrated? My son? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's interesting. I mean, um, Jack was raised with a, a, a someone who always took him around for um, meals and to restaurants and traveling all over the world to, you know, as I was writing about food, I used to be a travel writer. Um, and it, what's really interesting is that I, I um, gravitate toward um, Italian food because my, my, my family is Italian American. Italian American and Mediterranean food. And my son is obsessed with all things Japan and Japanese. <laughs> and it's something that's like not been my strong suit. Um, but he has kind of carved out his own niche in the kitchen um, with that. So that's, that's really cool. And, and it's such a different philosophy about food in terms yeah. of Italian and Japanese food is a hundred percent. I mean, food really ref reflects culture, right? So um, when I'm talking about the Mediterranean diet or the way that um, um, people in Italy eat, it very much stems from the climate and the lifestyle and the, um, 
the things that I know and love about Italian culture. Um, and the same is true with, um, with Japanese. There's such a reverence for, um, for the ingredients and the purity of the ingredients and, and really letting them shine and, um, and almost a like religious respect mm. for them. And, um, and so my son, when he, when he's cooking um, Japanese food, he's really um, embodying that or bringing that part of the culture to, to our home. It's pretty cool. That's great, that's great. Now, you also collect uh, cookbooks? I do. Yeah. I do. What was I have, your first cookbook that you uh, like you remember having as a child or well, that's an interesting story. Um yes, I have thousands of cookbooks. <laughs> I thousands. Um they are um they're an obsession of mine. And my very first cookbook was one that I found when I was working at my first restaurant job, actually. And I would take a break while I was working between shifts, between the lunch and dinner shift. And I would have like an hour to go walk around and come back be between shifts. And I walked into an antique store. This was in North Carolina. And I was um, like, the restaurant was right on the main street. And I walked into this antique store and I was looking at all the cookbooks. And I saw this cookbook from 1905 that was called The Epicurean. Mm. And I wow, what is this? This big, thick cookbook of like a thousand pages with like, in 1905, you can imagine it had like gold lettering and it had, you know, these beautiful illustrations. And I remember it was like $20. And I was like, oh, that's so much, but it's from 1905 and it's practically an antique. And I like reached my hand into my, um, into my <laughs> apron that I had been wearing from lunch when I was waiting tables. And I took out all these singles <laughs> and bought the Epicurean. Um, and it turns out like, and I loved this book. Um, and I was in high school at the time and the book would travel with me. And I, I, I did research about it and I found out that it was from this restaurant called Delmonico's in New York, which was one mm. of New York's first and and most legendary restaurants. Um, and it was this book, which is called The Epicurean, was published um, up until the 30s. So I've collected um, <laughs> about, about four or five different versions of that cookbook. Wow, and does it have illustrations in it? Gorgeous illustrations, I'll show you. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I wish I could, I don't have it here with me now. It's at my house in Brooklyn. Oh, but, that's cool yeah. though. I, I have the, um, I have a Betty Crocker that is illustrated by Charlie Harper, the uh, mid-century uh, bird. He does did a lot of bird illustrations, but this oh, was one gorgeous. of his commercial. And then I think I had one Andy Warhol had illustrated um, in the fifties, but I don't, I, I'm gonna confess, I am really bad with cookbooks. Like I'm really good with cleaning out the fridge. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this is what I have. Let's go with it. I yeah. had a recent. I had a recent failure. I'm gonna try it again. I soaked oh. some giant lima beans. They're not even lima beans. Not even butter beans. They're like they look like like they're epic sized beans. And I, right. I soaked them, but they're still kind of hard. So I got. I'm gonna make them into a casserole. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. And you cook them. You could also boil them. I had cooked them in vinegar, like hot vinegar, after I soaked them. Right. And then I uh, cooked them for a long time with the leftovers from the Swiss chard you gave me. Oh, good. Yeah. And then I thought that, and then I threw in some chicken, and then it still was meh. So I'm going to now turn them into, like, I'm going to get cream or something, because cream always makes it happy. It makes it better. You know what? Yeah. Make creme lemonade. fraiche, I love lemonade, lemonade out of lemons. That's what cooking's <laughs> all about. I'm telling you, it's um, there's always mistakes in the kitchen, and it's always about Tell how me about you a fail. Tell me about an epic fail. Oh, had. there's so many. I mean, there's it happens all the time. I mean, I'd say the most epic fail, which happens often. Well, no, I'm not going to say often. It, when it happens, you can't repair it. Is when you add salt instead of sugar, um, <laughs> you know, and then you know your <laughs> your cupcakes look beautiful, but you bite into them and you're like, oh no, what, what? <laughs> um, yeah, 
I mean, but sometimes it, it happened the other night where I had these gorgeous steaks and I was grilling them and I, um, and, and I overcooked them and, you it's know, it's going to happen, right? It happens. It bake, happens. Bake or cook? Definitely, definitely cooking because it's less of a science and more like you were saying, you know, you, you don't like, it sounds like you don't like to follow recipes. By the way, I like the cookbooks for the inspiration. I, I also don't follow them, the recipes. Um, and I think that's what makes a, a good cook is someone who can look at something and say, hmm, I'm going to take some things from this recipe, but then I'm going to kind of riff on it and do it myself, you know? Right, right. Baking, so you can do that. Baking, you cannot do that. that. No, I tried. No, <laughs> <laughs> I've tried twice. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's a science to how you know baking. You, you people ask us all the time in class, can you swap baking powder for baking soda? You definitely can't. I mean, it's a real science to how those things work in leaven and. Yeah, I tried to swap a hand mixer with a blender. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No. So it no. never rose. It never rose. Um, so your family's Italian. Uh-huh. Italian American. Yes. Southern Italian. Southern Italian. And what did you do the big Sunday dinner? Always, always. Did you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we did. And, uh, you know, and then, but then people geography and lifestyle change that. And my um, parents still will have dinner occasionally at three o'clock, two o'clock on a Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Sundays were always about getting together at my grandma's house. And, um, you know, it would just be all day hanging out with the family, cooking, eating, eating again. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And you're right, as, as, as the geography kind of, um, as people spread out, that becomes harder. But one of the things that I think is really interesting about quarantine and where we are now is that I find that I'm connecting with my family from far away more with mm -hmm. Zoom than ever and FaceTime than ever. And it feels like, hey, hey, this is uh, my colleague, uh, Anthony Vitorino. He's uh, Hi, Anthony. He's an Italian uh, and Spanish teacher at Jericho with me. Hello, how are you? Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. We were just talking about the Sunday supper tradition in many Italian and Italian American households. Mm -hmm. And um, did you have such a an upbringing growing up and having Sunday big Sunday meals? I did. I did. Uh, less so today. I think we're becoming more American. As, yeah. as Italians would say. Uh, yeah. But uh, yes, and I just remember the noise more than the food. <laughs> totally. I remember that too. I remember that too. I, I actually remember Sunday evenings going to bed and, and my, my mom and her sisters would still be talking around the kitchen table. <laughs> and I'd be like, <laughs> talking, I'm trying to go to bed. <laughs> All right. Now, Thanksgiving, did you have a lasagna with your thing? Always. Always lasagna with turkey. Yeah, I think that was the one option where you don't feel bad about celebrating an American tradition because like, oh, there's food there. So I understand what that means. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, the Italian American um, food approach to food is totally abundance. You know, uh, mm -hmm. my, my grandfather was my I come from a long line of butchers. My great grandfather was a butcher. My grandfather when he immigrated here, he became a butcher even at a supermarket. And he, um, you know, he didn't have a lot of money, but there was always a lot on the table and there was always a lot to share. Um, and that was where the priority was. And I think that that's why I started writing about food because I, it was so much a part of, you know, my, my, my culture and my, um, my heart. And, um, and writing is such a wonderful way to um, tap into those things about us. Um, so you collect Italian cookbooks? I, I do. I do. I, um, I collect a um, series of Italian cookbooks that are um, regional Italian cookbooks. So every, you know, there's so many provinces or regions. Um, it's, Italy wasn't unified until, you know, very late. Like I think it was 1861. Is that right, Antonio? Yeah. yeah except for Rome. Rome came later, but. So. so what I so as somebody who's interested in food, what I love is how there is this distinct um, 
regional cuisine to each region. And um, these cookbooks really celebrate that. And I wish I, I wish I had them here, but they're in Brooklyn. Um, but they're they're also beautifully illustrated, and they're um, they're put out by um, by Slow Food, which is this organization that is based in Italy um, and really celebrates the antithesis of fast food. You, you were in Italy a lot as a travel writer as well? I was, I was. We wrote, uh, my, my husband and I wrote a couple of Italian travel guides for Fromers, um, which, was a, which, which is a travel guide pub publisher. Um, and then I wrote some, I wrote a cookbook with a, a Venetian chef. Um, oh, wow. Um, did you use like squid ink? I sure did. Yeah. <laughs> Sepia ink. Yeah, I sure did. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I, I spent a lot of time in Italy and then I did a lot of articles um, in Northern and Southern Italy. I spent a lot of time in Sicily as well, which I love. So I know, I know typically when people talk about the regions and they talk about, oh, Northern Italy is different from Southern Italy, but given your experience looking at these cookbooks, through time, how, how has the Italian diet changed from your, your analyses of those older cookbooks to today? Uh, what would you say is, is an overarching theme, if there is any? Well, that's, that's such a good question. I mean, I think that um, over time, the Italian diet has become much more homogenous or, or much more like th that sense of regionalism. Um, it doesn't persist as much as it used mm -hmm. to. Um, I'm sure it, it. I'm sure it does in the local communities. But now, I mean, even if you look at um, companies like Italy, they they celebrate um, the foods from all over. So one of the interesting things is that um, um, Italians now know about um, all of the regional, uh, many of the regional food items and recipes. Um, and so that in that way, I feel like everyone has become much more um, global in their appetites or much more sort of pan Italian. Mm. Um, you know, this organization, Slow Food, they used to host, have you heard of it? I haven't, no. You know, so, so Slow Food started um, in the late 90s um, in Northern Italy in a town called Bra in Piemonte, um, and it was started by um, a activist who was protesting against um, McDonald's, and um, and so what they what they do is they really celebrate these regional um, foods in Italy, and they would have this food festival that was called Salone del Gusto or the Salon of Taste, and they invited people from every region of Italy to come and bring the um, the foods that were really special to their region. And of course that meant that um, businesses and farmers and food producers were really benefiting. And what ended up happening is the, the company like Italy, which you, uh, maybe you've heard of Italy, mm -hmm. they, they were founded, they were part of Slow Food. And, um, and when they opened Italy, it became a marketplace. And so, in, and benefiting all of the, the regional producers. So, in that way, that's just one way of answering your question to say that um, that that sort of, um, you know, the fact that people in Italy now eat food from all over Italy instead of just um, what's known as um, regional or the campanilismo. Campanilismo is this notion that you... Um, your your world is the, the campanile is the the bell um, mm -hmm. in the center of town and if you could hear the bell that was your world that was your radius now the radius is much wider mm -hmm. um, so tony your family is in sicily they are what were some what would be some of the regional foods that remind you of uh visiting your family uh you probably know more about this but sicilian cuisine is is slightly different from continental. Uh, one thing I would think of is panelle, which is a chickpea patty. Oh yes, I love uh, it. And it's and there was another thing, it's, and I don't know what it is in Italian, but in Sicilian, it's called mi, milza, milza, which is like a- Milza. Yeah, it's M-I-L-Z-A, it's, it's spleen, it's cow spleen. Oh yes, yes. And they, and they, <laughs> they, they put everything in, in bread, including ice cream. So you go to <laughs> Sicily and they put, ice cream in a brioche bun. And That's the best, my favorite. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, the the milzi is also sometimes called nervi, nervi, like okay. the, right. But yes, there's a there's a place in Brooklyn um, called F Ferdinando's Focaccia, and they make great focaccia and and that pillowy bread, and they fill it with um, what you're talking about oh, with that. Where in Brooklyn is that? It's um it's in Red Hook. Mm -hmm. um, near Red Hook in the um, sort of Columbia waterfront area. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, I, I'd have to get, I'd have to go there on purpose. <laughs> yes, totally. Where is your family from in Sicily? Uh, they're from Palermo. They're from a, a, t a t small town outside of Palermo. Awesome. That's, so it's, uh, yeah, and they have, they have two churches side by side. So they have what's called the Greek church and then the Latin church. I think it was founded by um, refugees of the Byzantine Empire. Wow. So, and obviously, you know, the, it's become more Italian and less Greek over the past 500 years. Uh, but that's sort of the history of Italy, right? It's, you know, that's they it. said, you know, we created in 1861, they said, we created Italy. Now we have to create Italians. Uh, because like you said, there's this, this idea of parochialism that I don't think beyond the world that I can see. Um, right. And that's always been a challenge. I mean, you see with the politics in Italy today, with the right wing, uh, they believe in in this idea that oh well, there are real Italians and not, just the way we say they're real Americans and not real Americans, they're saying they're real Italians and not real Italians. Uh, and the other thing I would say in terms of food, I remember going to Italy in the '80s, and there still wasn't a lot of prepackaged food. Like you couldn't find uh, peanut butter or frosted flakes, things like that. And then as I got older and I started going there. You know, I, I started seeing more of that. And uh, hopefully now with the slow food movement, there's this move back to uh, organic food or what now we label as organic, but back then they should just call food. Uh, right. Right. And, uh, and against the, the, the commercialization of food or the industrialization of food uh, that's been lost. Right. I almost thought of it as this is what it must have felt like in the 50s, you know, when people started giving their kids tang you know, and yes. space food and TV dinners. Like that's what it felt like for a moment. But, you know, now yes. slow food movement, there's an appreciation that uh, there's not only market value to Italian food, but there's nutritional value to it. So that's right. Let's stick to that's it. right. There's, there's such an appreciation for the, the handmade foods. And um, I think you're right. If there's a return to, um, there's a return to the, the basics and, um, and not the commercialization. It's interesting. Um, even big companies like, like Barilla, um, mm -hmm. you know, they, you know, they're the largest pasta company in the world, but they market a lot of um, uh, sort of niche uh, specialty items that are, you know, um, a little bit more handmade and um, slower to make. So yeah, there's definitely a return to that, getting back to getting back to the the good stuff mm -hmm. now you make pasta you make your own pastas i do yeah do i do I, I i did once uh, it's, the easiest years ago. Thing, it's the easiest thing to make i mean we teach our students to make it all the time you have to come to one of our classes i will have to uh what's your favorite noodle oh well you know again back to basics i just like a simple you know, it's just egg. It's basically just egg and flour, and then a tagliatelle, like a really like a like a flat, simple noodle with butter and brown. You know, a brown butter and sage sauce. Oh my gosh! And parmesan. Simple, simple, simple. It's interesting though. Like a lot of a lot of people think that Italian food is spaghetti and meatballs. That's Italian American food, right? Mm -hmm. um, when um, you know, when people like my grandparents immigrated here, that sense of being American meant that they wanted to put so much into their sauce. So it, in went the meatballs and the sausage and everything into a sauce. And, um, and in Italy, it's much simpler. It's, it's really um, more elemental. So like a ragu, which is a sauce, you know, doesn't, it's, it's less about the sauce and more about the noodle. I think that should be like on a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> it's more about the noodle. It's all about the noodle. Um, you, I'm keeping an eye on time. I know you have your class coming up today. 
I do. I do. And yeah. how many students do you think you'll have? Today we have 28. Um, wow. Yeah, we have a lot. We have a lot. And it's great because it's kids who zoom in from all over, all over the country. So um, it's great. We have kids from Atlanta. We have kids from Alaska who do it with <laughs> us. Yeah. And so from all different backgrounds, all different, so they're able to connect yeah. through food, which was yeah. your point about culture and food. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, every week we do a different sort of international dish. So, you know, we'll do fried rice one week and we'll teach stir frying. Um, the next week we'll do like, you know, um, enchiladas. Uh, this week we're, um, we're teaching how to make, it's sort of a fancy dish. We're teaching how to make galettes and because we're, it's summertime. So everybody, you know, can go to the farmer's market and get different vegetables. So we make a pie crust and basically make a dinner pie with whatever vegetables and cheese we put in our pie crust. So a savory, a savory pie. Savory collect. Exactly. Now, do you send out like a, a, a list, like get these ingredients for? We soda? do, yep. Yeah. It's already up on our website, so people could check and see like, oh, yeah, I have everything I need for that. Or, yes, I could do that. So, yeah. And that was we, dynamite. What was it again? For our studio it's called audience. The, it's called the Dynamite Shop. The Dynamite. Oh, you see, I'm writing it down. Look at my notes. The, dynam the Dynamite Shop. And you could follow us on Instagram too. We post, um, you know, the kids are amazing. They're such great cooks and um, we, they send us pictures and we post their dinners that they make for their families. And the parents are so grateful because the parents are cooking. I mean, look, we're, we're all cooking breakfast, lunch, and dinner these days. Right. So the, you know, the parents are like, thank you kids for making dinner. <laughs> That's great. I did note in my notes, the 1905, uh, book that you just that kind of set you off on this trajectory. I think it's pretty amazing that that book would have been used in the house you're in right now. I know, isn't that incredible? Yeah, I know. I think about it's those things all the time. Uh, so your house was from 1860, 18, 1863. Yeah, 1863. And how have you been uh, finding living in such a, a lovely old, old rambling? house <laughs> <laughs> um well we were expecting to to do some more renovation before we moved here full time after covid so it definitely um you know has some peeling paint but that's okay like i'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm and the I'm, kitchen's okay the kitchen you you the kitchen was the first thing i renovated the kitchen's great yeah the kitchen is good yeah it's i saw it before good. the renovation so yeah yeah i could go in there Let's see oh Oh, we're going on a tour, everybody. A tour. Can you see? Yeah. Just, um, this is the living room. The, that ceiling. I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, that is crazy. Uh, let's see. And here we are in the kit. Here's some cookbooks. Let's see. Uh, these are just some. Yeah. And there's my big stove. And I always like to, um, this is my stove here. Nice. And, and I always like to, I always like to have a painting um, at my, like, I, I always like to look at something while I cook. So that's a painting that I like. That's fantastic. Yeah. I want to thank you so much for joining us today and uh, for sharing not just your love of food and writing, but your house. Oh, I mean, are we going to the garden? <laughs> well, I just thought since we were talking about food, we might maybe we want to end up. Um, I'll show you my garden. So here's the thing about gardening: it's so easy. You put things in the ground, and they grow. Can you see that? Yes, there that is great. And and it's so vibrant and so you have like the healthiest soil, Hudson Valley <laughs> soil. <laughs> I, I do, I do. That's um, that's compost for you. <laughs> <laughs> It's well, that's fantastic. I want to thank you. Yay. Thank you. Thank um, you. I, I know you me. have your class. I but... do. I want to jump, but thank you for having me. It's been so nice. And, and Antonio, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. And Robbie, thank you. Thank you for sticking around. So <laughs> nice to meet you. Best of luck to you. You have a great teacher. Um, Nadine, you're so inspiring. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. He better say that. I'm writing his letter of recommendation. <laughs>